Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jordi Romero. And we're going to talk about uh, MPS, CSAT, and churn messages. I will go a little bit deeper into what that means in a second. And the original title was something about customers go first and feedback and stuff, but I changed it because uh, at, the end of the day, at the end of the day, these are tools. They are mechanisms to gather customer feedback. But the thing we really want to be talking about is uh, the transformation that a startup called Redbooth uh, went through and how we implemented the strategy and then some things weren't going as good as we wanted, it, uh, as we wanted them to be. And then through these mechanisms, we kind of were able to switch strategy back to something that was uh, better business. So Sindra already did uh, an introduction. I'm Jordi. Uh, we just started Factorial a few months ago. It's a, it's a software company that uh, offers a platform for HR managers in small and medium companies around the world. And we also offer the possibility to hire employee benefits from the platform. So basically, small companies can now manage all of their HR uh, staff in this platform and also hire things like health insurance, gym memberships, uh, ticket restaurant, and stuff like that through the, through the SaaS platform. Before that, um, I was at Redbooth, and that's actually some of the stories we're going to be talking about. Uh, Redbooth is a project management platform in the cloud. It's a company that got started in Barcelona around 2010. Um, so it got started here. Then we moved the company to California. We legally moved it there, raised some money there. Uh, it raised uh, up to Series B in fin financing, and we went through a lot of evolutions, and we're going to be telling some details later on. And then I started there as a CTO, Chief Technical Officer. And then I became the VP Business Development and Platform, which meant I was in charge of uh, partnership strategy and integrations with other companies. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or you can go check Factorial out at factorial.co. So uh, one disclaimer, this presentation um, I prepared for today but also for an event that happened this weekend, this past weekend in Berlin, which was um, a SaaS uh, founders event organized by a venture capitalist called Point9 Capital. So at this conference, there was a gathering of founders of software as a service companies, and among them, there was a lot of people from Zendesk. Zendesk is a, you know, one big success story of, of SaaS, software as a service, and the CEO and some of the top executives of this, of this company were there, and they were sharing a lot of insights of how they came from you know, the inception to the successful public company they are now. And I just wrote down some quotes that they said. Uh, this was last uh, Friday morning. So Mikkel Sven um, was, uh, was highlighting the, the success of Zendesk because basically they were able to instrument and mechanize the relationship and the communication between customers and the companies that use Zendesk, the platform and capture that uh, right now, for instance, ratings are ubiquitous, which means that all businesses and all services are using some sort of rating or qualified benchmark to see if you're doing good, if your aging's doing good. Like you take an Uber and you rate the driver, you go to Airbnb, you rate the host, you rate the location, you rate the cleanness. Everything we do right now has like immediate uh, quantitative and qualitative feedback. And that through rating, you can kind of um, reinforce or detect how well you're doing in terms of loyalty which means not just delivering a service, but uh, owing the, com the customers, making sure they're not just satisfied, but, but amazed with your service, and they will come back, and they will promote your brand and product, which is very important. Uh, the SVP of marketing, the senior vice president of marketing at Zendesk, uh, was also highlighting some metrics about this, so I just thought it, it kind of helped uh, set the stage. So what I wish we kind of talk about today, and please interrupt me anytime, ask questions, you know, share your experiences, whatever. Say your name and what you're doing so we can all understand uh, where the comments are coming from. So we want to talk about how to increase a company's value. I'm going to talk about this case, what we did in Redbooth. And in order to get there, we're going to look at some intermediate objectives, such as the revenue per account, like how much money we're getting out of each customer, uh, the attrition, which is the loss of customers over time, or increasing engagement, so how much uh, customers are using our product or service. Some of the outcomes of, of uh, listening to customers to positively impact these metrics would be what can we do different in our product? What should be our next developments in our product? How can we change the way we relate to our customers? Like what's the customer experience um, should, needs to be to, 
for, a, for an increased value or just service overall, like in case our product also has a service attached to it, like what changes can we do there? And we'll take a look at that in a second. So I made up this framework. Don't pay a lot of attention to it. It's just an excuse to kind of follow a flow and go step after step. It's five steps to actionable customer success. So let's pause here for a second. I think there's two important concepts here. One is actionable, and the other one is customer success. So customer success, uh, by that, like it's a, it's a very hot term right now. A lot of people use it. It can mean a function in a company. It can mean a department. It can mean a strategy to relate to customers. In this case, it's kind of going to mean the whole, the whole uh, group of concepts. It's how our company interacts with customers to guarantee their success after using our service. So our goal is not to make money. I mean, our final goal is to make money, usually, as a company. But in order to get there and not just make money but grow and get this existing customer base to help us grow even further, we have to make these customers successful at whatever they do. So for instance, if our platform is project management, we want to make sure our customers' projects are on time. They're you know, either increasing performance or cutting costs or you know, delivering a better service. If our, is is char, uh, if our service is HR, for instance, we want to make sure our company's employees are more satisfied, they are staying longer in the company, they're recommending their friends to come work for them, et cetera, right? So we're gonna focus on how to increase that through customer success, so asking and relating to these customers. And by actionable, I mean that all of these steps we're gonna follow the, here should have an outcome, should say, okay, we learned this, we measured it, we have a conclusion out of it, now this is the next step. You have to implement this new technique, you have to change your product in a way. So first step is asking, we have to open channels of communication with customers, we need to get the information coming. Then this information might be in different languages, different formats, it's unprocessed and, and unstructured, so we wanna make sure we, we do that. Then we wanna connect this to our existing company KPIs or metrics, so we wanna know what's impacting what here. So if all the customers are complaining about a part of our product, and if we fix that, what metric, what important metric is being affected by that? Are our customers staying longer with us because now our product addressed an issue? And um, understanding is kind of gonna give us the segue to acting. So once we're measuring things and we know the impact of different events, um, we can propose solutions and then we can actually develop them. Okay, so the first one is fairly easy. Um, let's say we have a software as a service company or any software company for the matter, we have people coming to us using our service, and then we wanna make sure they have the chance to give us the information that you know, like we need from them. There's a couple of important things to take into account here is uh, who should we be asking, and not just you know, opening up to everybody, but knowing exactly who we're asking at the point. Is this the customer that's actually using the product right now? Is it somebody who's pissed and just sent a support request saying login doesn't work? Uh, or somebody who just canceled their account. It's very important to open communication channels to all of them and also categorize accordingly. What do we wanna ask them? So, I mean, you have some feedback, okay, that's awesome, give us the feedback. Is there something specially that you know, makes you really love the product? Like, I wanna know what this is to give you more of this, and if there's something you don't love about it or you, you wish you could you know, uh, receive from our product and then you will be a promoter, that's even more important because then we can like extract this information, reinforce it and, and convert a passive uh, customer into a promoter. And what problems are we trying to, are, are you trying to solve with our, with our solution? What do we need to do for you to be successful? When do we ask this? I mean, it's heavily related to the who, so there is different interactions where we wanna be asking questions and here, is with all these frameworks coming, okay? So the title had MPS, CSAT, and churn messages. These are concepts that, like, I didn't come up with them. They're fairly well-known uh, best practices in the, in the industry. The first one is customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction is a transactional feedback that you get at certain events in the, in the life of a customer with your product. This is an example, I don't know if you recently went to an airport, almost all of them in the world right now have these devices, so after you go through security check, uh, you can, if you want, press one of these four buttons, and they use this to sometimes measure the performance of the actual agents that are checking you at that shift, or you know, they're validating if a new practice, like a new scanner or whatever, is making uh, passengers, in this case, happier or less happy. In our software, we can have the same, for instance, 
when a customer sends you an email saying login doesn't work or I tried to do this with your product and I couldn't do that, after this interaction, even if we resolved it or not, it was our fault, maybe it was their fault, we're gonna ask them like, how did we do here? Like, are you satisfied with the resolution of this transaction? I mean, the wording can be a little bit better. How would you rate your overall satisfaction with the service you received? Okay, that's better. And then this typically either one to five, four smiley faces, etc. And the way we measure this is either an average, like from one to five, and then we track 3.7, or we just count the, the satisfied or top satisfied accounts, and we say, okay, 75% of our interactions are, are good. In SaaS, for instance, this is something typically SaaS companies, software as a service companies don't have a problem with. A good CSAT is 98%, an okay CSAT is 90%. Anything below that means you probably have a problem in your processes and you should go ahead and fix them. Uh, if you're in the phone industry, for instance, that's a different story because they go after cost optimization and they have massive scales and then they're usually probably happy with a lower score. This is something, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be anything that a, a software company thinks about this too much. Like, it has to be perfect. It has to be 95 or better. If not, you're screwing up and there's bigger problems as we'll see. This you have to nail and it's easy. Just hire very good customer support people, you know, implant some process, use the good tools and this will come. Okay, this in my opinion is the juiciest uh, mechanism we're gonna be talking about. MPS stands for Net Promoter Score and it's a tool that uh, grow a lot in popularity the last few years. And I'm sure you've had this question many, many times. It's like, would you recommend this service or product to a friend or colleague? Like you get this, for instance, when you receive a, a receipt from an Apple store, like a physical store, in the bottom of every email, there is a link to answer this. If they go below 98%, they might fire somebody from the store that month. Like their Apple is crazy about MPS, for instance, and the Apple retail stores, they measure almost exclusively by this, by this metric. They're, they're almost religious about it. Maybe a little bit too much, but it's, it's very important. We're gonna see that this score is very, very um, negative, meaning that you can answer from one to 10, and the, the customer doesn't see the colors. <laughs> the customer just sees the numbers or the, or the runs to click in. This is a 10, this is a nine, eight, seven, six and below. Nine or 10 is good. It means this customer is a promoter. So it really loves your product and would recommend this product to their friends or, or colleagues or professional network. This is for me the super painful side. This, this is a passive, which means that a seven or an eight, which I thought was a pretty good grade, means nothing. It means you're not doing anything at all for this customer. They, they don't hate you, but it's totally useless what you're doing for these customers. You're not satisfying them. And anything below, it's negative. It's gonna subtract from your score. So typically what we see is, okay, some people are really pissed at us. We're not solving any problems. We're not making them successful. Some people love us. And typically before you stop, before you start uh, taking care of this, a bulk of your customers are gonna be here in the middle, which sucks because the formula is gonna say, count the percentage of uh, customers that you have here. So let's say 20% of your customers are voting uh, no, I don't want to change slide yet. Let's say 20% of your customers are super satisfied and 30% of them are here. Can somebody do the crazy math and tell me what's your MPS score? Minus 10. Exactly, and it sucks. Having a minus 10 in MPS, actually, you're gonna see later, this can happen, uh, but it's not good. But it's so easy because there's so many of these red dots here. So actually, it's, it's kind of tough to move it up. So it's a very strict score, it's very useful. Now, how do you actually implement a mechanism like this if you're somehow a digital or, or software business? There are some tools that do specifically this. Wootrick and uh, Delighted, they are software as a service platforms that only do this, basically. They have like a widget that you install in your application and you configure some rules. So after some time or some interactions, the customer is gonna see like a pop-up that says, hey, from zero to 10, would you recommend this service to friends or colleagues? There's Zendesk actually that is a much broader platform. They do customer support, uh, voice, uh, phone support, they do metrics, they do insights, they do a lot of stuff, and they also do MPS scores. There's another platform I didn't list here because it's kind of for bigger companies called Gainsight, which is more specialized in uh, customer success. And there's always the option of building your own stuff. And I'm gonna tell more about this because we actually build our own stuff. 
So some things to take into account if you're in the market for one of these solutions is, well, the main goal here is you want to score, right? Are you doing minus 10 or you're doing 40? You want to know that? And you want to collect the comments because as we're going to see, the, the quantitative aspect of it is, you know, it's, it's like a guideline you can follow, but the actual comments are the input that you're going to use to change the score. Without that, you're lost. So you want to be able to obviously measure the percent of responses by type, like buckets of uh, detractors and uh, promoters and uh, passives we don't care about, the score and the response rate. Response rate means how many people get impacted by this question, how many of them ignore it or answer it. So for instance, um, at Redwood, we used to have Zendesk actually. So once in a while, we send an email to all of our active customers. Not when they're using the product, not when they're having a problem, at the neutral point, like just Monday morning. They would all get an email asking, hey, you're using Redwood for a while now. Could you rate from one to 10? Uh, what's your, would you recommend, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we saw a response rate of like five to 10%. Uh, then we moved this into an in-app banner. Like when you actually launched Redbooth, you had there, you could dismiss it, but you had there the, the banner and we multiplied the response rate by four. So it, like the tool you choose and where you show it makes a big difference. Things you can think about is actually the placement, what I just said, like an email versus in-app versus mobile versus whatever it is, or physical real life, like the airport example, and the frequency. The data ownership and syncing thing we're gonna talk more about later. So um, we were using Zendesk actually, we had some results, we got some score, we got, we got worried about the score because it was actually minus 10. <laughs> And we knew we had to do something about it. And then we wanted more data, more frequent data, and more segmented. So we wanted to be able to mine this data by type of customer, when we acquired this customer, what product they're using, basically cross it with all the information we had. So we decided to break this in-house. We built a small um, open source product, actually, that, um, that you can install in your web application and shows in-app after 30 days for existing customers, and then from that point on, it repeats every 90 days. You can configure that, of course. That's uh, kind of like what we saw, is enough information without bothering too much the customers. Um, one, some of our goals was plugging it in into our own BI, like our own business intelligence tool, so we could have a unified dashboard with MRR, like uh, revenue growth metrics and MPS and correlate everything, and integrate it with CRM, like Salesforce data, Zendesk data, whatever, HubSpot, Gainsight. So as I already said, we increased the response rate 4x, and uh, we went from having once a quarter via email to having it in-app following this formula. So that was pretty good. So that's what MPS, uh, this is a timeline of MPS scores or MPS service after time. These are more or less real data. Um, I removed some events to, to make it easy to follow, but basically what happened here is it's almost the case I said before. We had a 25% uh, promoter um, base, 40% passive base, which is pretty common. Most people say, yeah, you're doing a pretty good job, seven, eight, that's okay, doesn't matter. And 35 for uh, detractors, so se uh, six or less, which means you really have an issue and you have to figure something out. So that's a minus 10, just here between seven, five, and 15. So we're gonna look later at how we change things, like how we basically detected some challenges that these detractors were having and address them right away, like get the hottest topics and go fix them. And we heard at what was really delighting our promoters and we did a little bit more of that. Sorry, what is the, the, the time frame from the first to the yeah, last one? These are months, these are months. Each bar is a month. Yeah, yeah. So MPS is something you can change quickly if you have hot issues, like you're really screwing up somewhere. For instance, everybody is telling you to do something and you don't do it because you believe you don't have to do it and they really hate you for that because it's like, you should, you should just do that and then you do it and then you're like, boom, 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 you know, like that's it and that's actually what happened. So our, uh, this Redbooth uh, project management software uh, was uh, satisfying some customers, like they could manage their tasks and so on. 
but there was a common issue actually. They wanted one kind of report that's called the Gantt report. Um, and everybody was asking for it, like for years. We even had it and we removed it. And at some point we did this, the score was bad. And it's like, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's do something about it. The team built a prototype of the, of the Gantt chart, was exposed to, to some of the people that told us they cared about it. They were Im immediately very satisfied. Then it got released to everybody and a bunch of people went from passive to like, yeah, I can manage my tasks to awesome. I can finally run the report they always wanted. So that's a way to get a quick bump. As we're going to see, there are some other issues that are long term and you know, they, they take a whole company to change to be able to address them. So that's how the picture can change from a minus 10 to a 25, I guess. Any questions? Cool. Okay, so now kind of moving away from MPS for a moment. Uh, oh, sorry. So the question is if the detractors can be influenced by banners or other marketing campaigns or other interactions, yes, totally. Like this, this measures the overall service that you're offering this customer. If you're annoying this customer all the time with retargeting, for instance, and you should not retarget them, it, it will probably be affected. In our experience, it's much deeper stuff that gets in here. Like people tend to care, like if we're trying to make them productive with a tool, that's what they care the most about when, when they answer. But if you have terrible customer support people and each time they call, they like disrespectful or you know, not helpful and so on, it's gonna impact this heavily. That's when it's good to have different metrics like CSAT. You can detect that early, get, you know, get that thing out of the picture and then focus on MPS. The particular case of retargeting, I don't know how you can segment this out. If you could cross it in your data set, for instance, say people who are most heavily attacked by retargeting have a lower NPS than those who are not, that's gonna take some data mining and somebody in the team who's really checking all the data against different sources, but I guess you could detect it. But it's, it's a tricky one. <clears throat> cool, so quickly into churn messages. So churn stands for uh, lost business. So you acquire a subscription and at some point you lose this revenue, you lose this usage, you lose this customer. That's a churn customer. And when this customer leaves, it's very important that you take as much information as you can from this interaction because they're passionate, they are definitely pissed, definitely disappointed by you. So they really had expectations on you, spend some money on your product, spend time adopting it, training people, convincing, spending social capital in the business and they didn't succeed, so that's pretty bad. But at the end of the day, if you send somebody from, let's say, your product team, marketing team, customer support or success teams to go talk to this person and say, hey, first of all, I'm not gonna try to sell you anything again. You know, like you have to be very honest. Like one thing we noticed we screwed up is when you lost a customer because your product didn't, didn't solve any problem for them. And then this, this person went out and said, what if we give you 20% discount? Would you come back and I'll add five more seats? And that's horrible because like, if you didn't solve a problem well enough to pay, in this case, five bucks a month per user, like, it's not about 20% discount. It's about understanding what they were trying to do that you failed at uh, fulfilling. So yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. This was very useful as long as you collect all the data, segment it, and cross it with the others as we're gonna see later. So we open communication channels. We're listening to customers. We have many ways for us to listen to customers. Then this is noise. It might come even in many languages. It comes like it's free form a lot of times. Like there is a, an MPS score, which is a number, but the most important information is the actual message they attach to it. We need to process this. So things that we actually did that were really useful. And once we started doing this, like actually MPS meant something to us. So they're like, oh, I mean, stand that's Oh, hey, that's good. No, it's actually people are complaining about performance. They're complaining about our mobile apps. Like for instance, Nobody, like, okay, uh, mobile app ratings tell you stuff, but when people uh, evaluate your entire service and the thing they are most, more pissed about is the mobile app and the performance and the UI, that means you should seriously take, take that into account. And we're gonna see that's a real example. And another thing that we started doing and I, I saw having really good effects in the, in the collaboration between teams was sharing this information. So, Usually, 
some, well, not usually, sometimes you have product people looking at this stuff. Sometimes you have customer support or success people, uh, people looking at that. And then they do their metrics, they have the dashboards, maybe they report to their boss and they say, look, we're going up, we're going down, whatever. And nobody really hears about it or cares about it. One thing that we saw made a big difference is when the, the people responsible for this collected all this information, kind of you know, drew some charts and shared some information, collected all the feedback into categories, and then shared it at an all hands. And the whole company would see, guys, we're doing okay, we're doing great, we're not doing so well. People love us because <coughs> our mobile applications, but they hate us because of our performance. Like, everybody understands this, everybody has a shared mission and objective. And like, you can have, like, for instance, an engineer that wouldn't have this input before come up with a solution, say, I was thinking of this refactor, I didn't propose it because I thought it was not relevant, but if our biggest problem is performance, maybe it's a good idea to work in this refactor. So actually, this helped a lot. This is an example, it's actually a real example of, uh, of the components, as we call them, which is group all of the feedback that we get into different either product components or uh, root causes of contact. So product components are parts of your product or service that the people might be either happy or unhappy about. And root causes of contact are why did they come back to us in the first place. If it's MPS, it's neutral. If it's customer support, why are they writing us? We had a lot of, this is, uh, this is components, so we don't have root causes here, but we had a huge problem with billing inbound requests. So a lot of our customer support time was handling somebody who said, I wanted to add a new user to my account, but the credit card didn't take it, so I had to do this and that, or I wanted to change credit card and it didn't work. And it's not just inefficient because you have people actually solving stuff that should be automated. These people are dissatisfied because if they have to do something, then it doesn't work, then reach, um, reach out to us, have to figure out, etc. it's a problem. So it's good to categorize root causes of contact. And components is critical because you know what's working and what's not. In this case, this was uh, the detractors components. So usability was a big problem. Okay, usability is a terrible component because it's too generic. It doesn't really give us an insight on what to fix. But that was the product, uh, product management team's job to go after these people and say, hey, you're not so happy with the usability. What are you trying to achieve? Like, what, what did Red Booth not do so well for you? And then after some interviews, we got this information. And then one after one, the team went, like engineering, marketing, product management, they went one after one and nailed them. And, and you see the MPS score going up and up. Okay, so we basically categorized everything and segmented a little bit the, the causes for contact or satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. The next thing you wanna do is connect these measurements and these sources of information with your business metrics. Like, the beginning of the presentation, we said our goal here is to increase company value, okay? That's, in general, every executive's job in a company is to increase the company's value. How do we do that? Well, we can take at these intermediate objectives and say we have to increase our um, average revenue per user. Like we have these customers, we wanna, we wanna make more money out of them. Or we need to reduce the attrition. We don't wanna lose customers. So how do you connect these measurements, these sources of information, these root causes of uh, contact with this? Basically, dump all the data somewhere where you can query it. So data warehouse is like a big database where you can connect everything and then uh, graph it out, uh, come up with conclusions, etc. Process it so it's all in the same format. You can actually uh, cross and plug this in into some dashboards, charts, etc. So that's, that would be what BI stands for. The rules here, something we learned the hard way actually, define company standard segments. Like, who knows here what an SMB is? Can somebody say what, what an SMB is? Small, medium business. Okay, define SMB. Mm, by number of companies? How many? Uh, I don't know, uh, up to 500 it's medium. Okay. Before uh, 50 it's medium. Okay, somebody has a different number in mind? It depends on the country. Depends. Exactly, so it's a mess. It's a huge mess. So, the first thing, like, we have a problem with SMB. No, that's not true, SMBs are doing very well. Well, it depends, what's an SMB, no? So, like, somebody decides and says, this is an SMB to us. It doesn't matter if everybody has different opinions, we're gonna go with this assumption from now on. Um, 
don't just connect everything real time and send reports to everybody to look at unless they have information. That's a common mistake we did as well. Uh, and always track your own progress. That's something we've done and I've seen a lot of people do, which is have a problem, create a dashboard, look at the dashboard, come up with some conclusion, and then go home. And then the next time you have a new problem, you create a new dashboard, you look at the dashboard, you come uh, up with some conclusions, and then you go home. But when you actually put them together, it's like, oh, that was totally wrong. Like, each time you want an answer, like, if you want your BI to tell you something, it's going to tell you whatever you want it to tell you. So what you have to do is just define some standards and let them evolve. So that's very important. Otherwise, we're going to lie to ourselves. This is just a couple of screenshots of uh, two BI tools I've used at Redwood. We use this one. I've been playing with this one now. This is Chartio.com. And this is uh, mode analytics. I actually recommend Chartio. So the way this works is basically you connect uh, data sources, so databases basically, that feed data into this, into this platform. And then it has a very easy drag and drop interface to create whatever graphs or, or instrumentation you want here. It's, it's smart, so you can do a lot of drag and drop. You can share definitions, like if you say this is an SMB, so you can kind of create a canonical definition and then expand it, or you can go hardcore and edit the SQL yourself. Moat is kind of more do-it-yourself, but it's, it's also cool and it's cheap. Okay, so the second last step here is we have information. We have customer feedback that's coming through the process. We're processing it, we're segmenting it, putting it inside of buckets, connecting its evolution with business metrics, now we need to come up with some insights, some ideas, right? So for me, this is the, more impor the most important. It's like, here's the happy idea moment. It's like, this is what we need to do. You saw a pattern, you found a pattern, you validated it, the whole team looked at it, there's some proposal, you share this information with the team, they came back with, with some conclusion, and then you brainstorm some solution. Uh, you make sure this solution is like, compatible with all the teams, and you kind of define, okay, we're going to do this change now. This change is going to have an impact in this segment, and uh, that's going to fix X, Y, Z. This sounds very abstract, so that's where I want to go deep, is I want to tell you a horror story. This is, uh, well, you're not going to understand anything until I explain you. So this is uh, the result of our first NPSs after we realized we had a problem as a company. We, at Redbooth, offer this project management software in the cloud. So people came in, they pay for it, they use it, and they go. So this is called churn. Churn is a big problem in, subscri in subscription businesses. It's especially big in, uh, in collaboration businesses. There's many reasons for that. We didn't need to go deep. And it was a problem for us because we were spending a lot of money to bring customers in. We were spending a lot of money to develop a product that they used and then they left before we could get enough money out of them. So the whole machine was like, you know, a leaky bucket. You put water in it and then you walk three steps and you're out of water and you put more water in it and then you're always without water. And that sucks. That happens in general, but it happened a little bit more to us than it happened to other people. So we knew we had a problem, we had to address it. We ran some MPS scores, we saw minus 10, okay, we have a problem, you know, there's, it's good, there's a, there's a low starting point, so we can go only up from there. And this is the process that actually the product management team did uh, at processing this information, right? So one of the first segmentations the team did is we're going to segment it by the role of the person that answers this MPS uh, survey. So in Redwood, you can be the first person that comes in and creates an account. This means you really care about that, right? Because you're looking for project management solutions. You find two or three. You sign up. You set it up. You invite some people. And you're a customer. Okay, that's the creator. Then you might say, okay, in the company, it's not just me managing things, it's two or three more people, so I'm gonna invite them and I'm gonna make their admins. And then there is a bunch of other people who actually do the work that gets tracked in tasks, and those are the participants, okay? So this is the whole team using Redwood. Okay, when we segmented the, the MPS score by role, we saw that the person that thought this was a good idea in the first place, they were happy about it. Of course, they chose it, so they're super biased, right? If, if they said this was terrible, it means they're admitting their own mistake and people don't like to do that. So they said, this is a pretty good tool. I chose it, of course it's a good tool. 
Their peers said, yeah, it's okay. I have some reports, like, you know, people do the work and now I can see it, which is better than asking, is this done yet? Is this done yet? No, I have my reports, project management is cool, but it's not like rocking my world. And then there's this poor guy that suddenly gets tons of emails and tasks and things saying, do this, do that, do this other thing, and everything is out of control because we spend a lot of time building stuff for these people and nobody really cared about this poor guy here. And it's the essence, right? If work doesn't get done faster, and if people go against the tool, it's not going to go in favor of customer success. So this is a problem. How did we address this problem? Well, we detected there was a lack of functionalities. There was good reporting, and there was good tools for the managers to kind of see things from the top. But when you receive a lot of inbound requests, you want to see what am I supposed to do next? This is tricky. This is one of the examples that didn't get fixed in two weeks. This was feeding input into our product roadmap, and still, the team is still working on them today. And this was a year, almost a year ago when we ran this. So a year after, we're still executing this. <coughs> because this means changing your product. And changing your product is not something you do overnight, especially when you're like six year old, you have a team of 60 and a lot of customers. You cannot just change everything overnight. You need to evolve. So that's one thing we saw. Then things started getting really ugly, because this we kind of, OK, it's just product. We will fix it. But here, it gets ugly, because this is very hard to understand at first sight. This is one NPS survey, one. It was done at the end of 2015. One day, we sent an email to 4,000 companies, I don't know how many employees, to everybody using Redbooth, and we said, would you recommend Redbooth to a friend or colleague from 1 to 10? And we got the score. So we're segmenting them here by when they paid. So we had some customers here that have been with us for three, two, two and a half years or more, or three, four, five. We have some customers that have been here for one and a half years, ones that just came earlier that year, and ones that we just acquired. So there is an obvious evolution here, and we knew what happened between these years. And I'm going to tell you, because then you start realizing a lot of things, right? In 2013 and before, we used to be a freemium product. So a product that offered a decent service for very small companies for free forever. And we had some growth, like people came in, used it. Many people didn't pay for it, and that was OK, because they recommended it to other people, and they liked it a lot. And some paid, because they were bigger companies, and at some point you had to pay, and that was OK. We saw that this was not very efficient in uh, monetization-wise, so we decided to make a change to paid trial. So we had a 30-day trial period that's free, and then you have to pay. It doesn't matter if you're one person, five or 500. After 30 days, there is no free product. So we killed all the virality of a freemium product there. But in exchange, we hoped to get some more money because people couldn't use it for free, so they had to pay it, even if they were small. And then later on, we saw that it was very hard to build a growing business with very small accounts one at a time because it costs a lot to acquire them, to serve them, and they're only paying, like, what, $40 a month? So we decided to go uh, fish bigger fish, basically. So during 2014, we said, we're going to move from the SMB to the meat market. We're going to stop fulfilling the needs of the smaller companies we got. They don't give us enough money. We're going to go uh, after bigger companies. Are we gonna, these bigger companies, they don't just come on their own. So we need to change from uh, freemium to trial. And they don't just figure things out themselves. They need a sales rep. They need a person that sells this product to them. So we did the whole strategy change. This meant new teams, new funding round, new people in the team, changing, changing roles in the company, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't see this before. We were flying blind. And at some point, we saw this. And it's like, OK, what's happening here? The people that came under one promise, on average, they're 30. That's pretty good. The people that came when we were we, we stopped caring about the small companies, and we started, we started caring only about this you know, mid-market, like a few hundred employee companies and so on. They didn't like us as much. And when we really started only selling through the sales team, doing a training, like acting enterprise, then they actually didn't like us at all. So that's very bad. When our average was almost minus 10, that was very bad. So at some point this year, uh, we started realizing this, and there were a couple of experiments where we said, okay, something's not going well here. Let's start rolling back. Let's start undoing some of the things we did, but partially only. So we're going to take a segment of customers, any company with 200 employees or less, 
is going to go totally autonomous. Nobody's going to talk to them. It's going to be self-service. They're going to have the features that we used to have and we removed because enterprise don't want these features and so on. And we saw that this actual segment was doing pretty well. And then the last part of the story is when we went ahead and said, okay, let's do one thing. Let's query the database and separate everybody that somebody talked to and everybody that somebody didn't talk to. So this no touch means people that came in on their own, they figured out the tool, they figured out the business, the price, everything, and they set it up. And sales touch means the people that they were blocked from self-serving and they had to talk to human and this human had the monthly quota that was probably not well set up and uh, this human wanted to convince them that this was a good tool for them. So what we saw is these people, okay, we were not growing as fast as we wanted here, but they were happy. What they found and they chose to use was going pretty well. These people here, they were forced to use something, and especially what we detected is they were overpromised a lot of things. So the salespeople heard the message that we're going to go enterprise. We're going to be building all of these features. Our product is not for small companies anymore. We don't have it yet, but it's coming. So a lot of people came in under this promise, and this promise didn't really get delivered because you know, the transition didn't go well. And what we did here is both the go-to-market and the strategy didn't go as planned. At this point, we stopped everything. There was a drastic change in the business here. It included one VP getting fired and like eight to 10 people moving on. We stopped having the sales force, like the people that were selling the product, over-promising and uh, pushing this down to people's throats and went back to a no-touch model, changed the metrics pretty well, soon, and then we started implementing some of these changes like progressively. So when we go back, where's my laptop? When we go back to the other thing, right? So this is long, this is low. Like we started the experiment, okay, we see some early good results, we're gonna keep going. We go more drastical, now everybody's no touch, there is nobody trying to oversell them, trying to push for a bigger quota, trying to make them like, what we would do is we would go from somebody who is at, an, at a six or a seven in MPS, so they're kind of not really loving us. They're using our product for 10 people and we would say, hey, invite 20 more people and go to our more expensive product. And they said, fuck you, basically, because they're not even happy in the first place and we're pushing more sales down to their throats. So that was a big learning there. And basically the conclusion here is, okay, our example is a little bit extreme. It's not just tweaking your product. We actually have to change the company strategy. I think it's interesting to share, but usually what happens is you go back to all your customers. It's like, okay, you said you don't like the user experience or the interface. Tell me more about it. What was your final goal? You know, what were you trying to accomplish? How does your team try to do this without Redwood, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So we improve some of these experiences and interactions with the customers. We obviously fit things into the product roadmap. Right now at Redwood, all of the inputs to the product roadmap come from this process. It used to be kind of like happy idea. Like, I think we should do this. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea, so let's do it. Not anymore. <laughs> so now it comes from this process. Uh, one interesting part is when a team develops something, it goes into a beta feature, which means it's not automatically released to everybody. We selectively deploy it to some people. Who do we deploy it to? People who told us they care about it. So they wanted to get something out of this. They're gonna be the most qualified feedback out of this. They help us tune it, then it goes out to everybody and everybody's a little bit happier. And uh, eventually, there is some, some processes like customer interaction. If your CSAT is very bad, then you wanna tweak that. You wanna make sure you answer fast. You don't delegate and then delegate and delegate again and then come back, oh sorry, the technical team is looking at it. Like improve these processes a little bit. It's not rocket science, but you have to do it very well. You need good people there. And then so them retrospective, do some retrospective analysis. Like, you know, what are we doing wrong here? What did we do wrong during all this <coughs> process? Let's look back, let's look at the evolution. Let's be honest about it. And in our case, it led to a big, <coughs> acknowledgement of our strategy is not working well. We have to change our whole strategy, which means for a startup with uh, venture capital, I don't know if you saw in the first slide, it said something like $22 million in venture funding. It means going back to your board of directors and said, remember when we told you we were gonna do this and it's gonna be awesome? Well, it's not going very well. We have to undo some of these things and we need more money. So that's a tough conversation to have and like, you need to be very sure about it. So here's what I already showed you, happy ending. 
sort of like a lot of things improve, you know, still a lot of work to do, but we did fix a lot of stuff. And I'm gonna quote actually my colleague here, John Sonnenschein. Uh, he is the one that led some, uh, many, of these, uh, many of these changes in the company. Like he saw something was wrong with churn. He used to be the head of product, and as a head of product, the CEO would say, your churn sucks, go fix the product. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna change something in the product, and churn still sucked. And then we said, no, that's because marketing is bringing the wrong customers. So let's bring, customer, let's bring marketing for a while. And then marketing said, look, I'm just doing the same as always, and suddenly they didn't like us anymore. And then we'd say, okay, that's because sales are just pushing stuff down their throats because their comp plan is wrong. And eventually it's like, okay, let's use some science here. Let's listen to our customers. Let's come up with all of these conclusions. And he quoted this in a Medium post that kind of talks about this transition. We cut our net MRR churn by 50%. That means the percentage of revenue we lose every month got divided by two, which is pretty good. So we went from being bad in the industry to being above the industry standard. So now we're actually, like, there's always room for improvement, but it's not our biggest problem right now. And important thing, this happened to have a kind of happy uh, coincidence or happy side effect, which is our uh, lifetime value to CAC ratio. So how much we get out of our customer versus how much we spend to get this customer improved 5x. Why is that? because customers now like our product more, so they stay longer, so they pay us more money because it's a monthly fee. And since we happened to get rid of a 10 people sales team, that was a lot of money we were spending to acquire customers, and now this became automation systems in online marketing and uh, drip campaigns and customer success process and so on, we spent a lot less to get a bunch more. So it was like 2x, 2.5x, and combined is 5x, which is Pretty good. Also because your companies are now bigger companies, so they pay more money. No, that was the fallacy. That's what we thought. Yeah. It, they ended up being the same companies. They're just more satisfied now. Okay. That's what we thought would happen, but it's a longer story here about why bigger or smaller companies use some collaboration products or not. The truth is this product, Redbooth, is very good for a size of customer. For a big kind of customer, this level of transparency and freedom doesn't work well. And we thought we would lead this change, but we didn't. And then we kind of reverted some of these assumptions based um, back with data, and then went to what we knew how to do, but actually doing it very well, or better. Uh, so yeah, it, it, have, it had a happy ending. Uh, so that's everything I have. I hope you have some questions, and uh, yeah, happy to share. <coughs>